Ohio. I've never really exceeded beyond those skill base, I don't think. But uh, there, were, there was a team of us. It was a large church, and uh, we would empty trash cans every night and mop and wax floors and dust and vacuum the sanctuary. And the sanctuary was old-style Lutheran, not like this one, old-style Lutheran sanctuary with wooden pews, you know, fixed to the floor and uh, high ceilings lined with stained glass all the way up the nave to the transept, and then a high altar in the front with wood panels going all the way to the top and a dome that was circled in uh, stained glass. It was quite the church. It was a, it was a spooky old church, actually. Uh, you know, kids, these, the kids that grew up in this congregation don't know anything about spooky churches. There's nothing spooky about this church. These chairs don't creak. The floors hardly creak. There's nothing really particularly spooky about it. But I was in the sanctuary, and this is Ohio kind of in the school year, so it was getting kind of dark, you know, late in the afternoon when we were doing our cleaning, but I was assigned to uh, waxing the, the pews because we did that. Easy to get up from if they're waxed, you know. <laughs> I don't know. They kept me busy. So I was waxing along, minding my own business, deep in my own thoughts, when I had that sudden sense that there was something not right, that there was someone there. You've had that happen, probably. You didn't know exactly what it was. I was just lost in my own thoughts, and I became aware of, my, of, the, of a presence. I don't know what got my attention first, if it was a sound or maybe a smell or just some crazy sense that I was being watched. But I stopped in place, and fear began to seize me, and I began to look around, and I thought, I must be crazy. There's nothing there. And I thought maybe it was just the sound of myself echoing in this cavernous building, in this empty sanctuary. But just to be sure, I said in a low voice, is someone there? <laughs> Silence. Relief. And then suddenly, there was a crack of the pew, which meant only one thing. Someone was in the pew. And I looked around on impulse, and suddenly rising, this black, shadowy blob was rising in the pew, two back from where I was dusting the back of the pew, silent, unspeaking, menacing, shadowed. I jumped. Hoping it was a human being, I think I blurted out something like, you can't be here! <laughs> and I bolted down the road to the side aisle, back through the, what was uh, like an overflow area, into the well-lit uh, education wing of that particular building. Back in those days, we had those education wings full of kids and where the rest of the crew was working and to allege safety. Tim, who is our crew chief, is now the pastor of Christ Lutheran Church in Bexley, Ohio, which is fascinating. Uh, and he said, as any good pastor would, well, we gotta go see what you saw and to see if they needed some help. I wasn't convinced. You know, I was still, my heart was still pounding in my throat and I was still dry mouth and I was worried, but he convinced me and we returned and there in the, in the rows where I'd, I'd left that thing, there was this black blob, a woman, it turned out, an, an elderly black woman, though you didn't know until you got very close to her, she was almost as wide as she was tall, not because she was heavy. In fact, she was quite frail and she was quite elderly. She was homeless and she was wearing everything that she owned. So she was almost as wide as she was tall. And she could barely speak. She clearly wasn't well. She spoke like someone who's very, very, very old in just partial whispers. She clearly needed help. I was still afraid. Even as my compassion grew, my adrenaline wouldn't let me relax. Tim, not startled as I had been, amused at how startled I had been, was able to assist her, call an ambulance. They came and picked her up and took her, and who knows what happened to her. Have you ever been afraid like that? Have you ever been startled like that in a way in which you don't understand what it is that's happening and what kind of manner of thing this is before you? You know, fear has a way of gripping us and not letting us go. Fear can keep us from moving forward. Fear can trap us in the past or in a mistake or in some agony we've experienced. Fear will reduce creativity, suspend compassion and reason, and bring forth our worst self, negating our own independence, negating our relationships, negating community for safety. 
fear is the center of our gospel reading for today from Luke's gospel. And we're in a summer series, and the series is entitled Building the Beloved Community. Certainly you cannot build any kind of community or any kind of relationship based on fear. It'll never really live. And our reading today comes from Luke's gospel, where Jesus comes ashore off of Lake Galilee, and he's gotten off the boat where he has just calmed the storm on the sea. And you need to know at this point that the sea in ancient Israelite understanding was sort of the place of primordial evil. Jesus has stilled the storm, exercising sovereignty over it. And now he has arrived on the other side of the sea in a Gentile, non-Jewish kind of area. And upon arriving, he's immediately confronted by a man possessed. Now, these are categories that we're not used to, but he's not in his right mind. The story tells us he is out of relationship with himself. He is out of relationship with his community. And ultimately, he's out of relationship with God. He's a man possessed by evil spirits. The spirits recognize Jesus for who he is, the son of the most high God, the sovereign one. And they're begging for their safety. They ask Jesus not to send them to the abyss, but allow them to leave the human being. Even the demons seem to understand that this possession should be a repossession. This isn't right. And Jesus asks for the name of the evil presence. And the response is startling. Legion. Now, that's a Roman designation. Not a Jewish designation, not even a Canaanite designation, and certainly not a designation of the people who live uh, organically in that area, natively in that area. They, they were all organic farmers in that area, and none of them were legionnaires. Um, the R Roman designation, a legion of soldiers from Rome was approximately 6,000 people. 6,000 people. Now, it is staggering to even begin to try to imagine that kind of brokenness in a person. How can you be so fragmented by pain that you can only now describe yourself as many? Here's a person that's in so much pain that they cannot be contained to live with others anymore. He's so broken that it goes beyond our normal categories. You know, he's just got bad behavior. He's kind of acting out, or even more profound professional categories like being mentally ill. This is super natural, way beyond the natural. And his action and his person have so inflicted the community with pain that he's subject only now to the mechanisms of objectification. He is watched. He's constantly under guard. He's bound hand and foot like a prisoner to keep the community safe. He lives in solitary, wild places and among the tombs. He's a man as good as no one, as good as dead. He is overrun by a brutal, overwhelming force, legion. Like a blob rising from a pew in a silent sanctuary, people recoiled from him told him that he didn't belong, marginalized and objectified him until he was something other, something other than human. You know, people can get that way, right? I mean, you've seen it. We, we, we can categorize immigrant or white man or old white man or person of color or old or young or millennial, American, poor, rich, gay, straight, even Christian and not Christian, lost, even categories like being sick or in remission. And sometimes the category is so binding to us that there's no escaping it, there's no outliving it, there's no getting out from underneath it, and it dehumanizes us, even in a community like this, to be asked about illness constantly dehumanizes us. It begins to serve as an identity, how we see ourselves, how we understand ourselves, what we're all about. And sometimes, you know, places have, have that too, you know. All you got to say is Chernobyl or Three Mile Island or the Twin Towers or the Alamo or Fallujah or a border wall. 
And they become so detached from the people that inhabit those places, they only bear the tragedies of a moment in their name. It's that way for Gerza as well. The Gospel of Luke was written probably somewhere around 80, 80 to 90 uh, in the first century. Its author, its author would pick words very carefully in this particular story about the Gerizim demoniac, a guy from Gerza. The region of the Gerizim is a setting of a horrific historical event. It takes place after the life of Jesus, but before the writing of the Gospel. According to Josephus, who is a Jewish captive and a Roman historian, during the late 60s, toward the end of the Jewish revolt, the Roman gen general Vespusian sent soldiers to retake Gerza. And the Roman unit, known as Legio Decum Fortensis, marched on them and killed 1,000 young men, imprisoned their families, burned their cities, and attacked the villages throughout the region, which called, was called the Decapolis. Many of those buried in that Gerizim tomb would have been victims of this slaughter. Luke knows this. The tombs that this man inhabits is the setting of our gospel reading. Now, when the legion occupying the demoniac encounters Jesus, it begs not to be consigned to the abyss. Rather surprisingly, Jesus permits legions to enter a herd of pigs that are grazing there on the hillside. I'm not sure if that's what pigs do, but that's what it says. Jews regard pigs as unclean animals, unfit to eat. We heard that in our first reading today. And other abominable things, along with bacon, are in their broths, Isaiah said. So we sort of write this detail off, except for this fact. Oh, can you go forward one, Luke? Forgot that. Go forward one. Okay. There's a painting of uh, the swine herders. Go ahead. Go ahead, two more. Before you feel too badly for the swine that are pictured there, it would be healthy and well noted that maybe Luke is talking about politics here. Luke wrote this gospel 10 or 20 years after the slaughter of the young men in garrison. The emblems of the Legio 10th Fortensis is a pig. The 10th Legion participated in the siege and destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But before they did that, they conquered Israel and renamed it Palestine and was stationed in Jerusalem after the war. For the people of the area, pigs would be an absolute fitting destination for this horde, this legion. Here the story takes a darkly humorous turn for us. For legion, a marauding horde of murderers, thinking that it was avoiding the abyss, promptly enters their emblem and are drowned in the sea. Now remember, right before this story, Jesus has just left the boat, and the boat has been rocked by a storm on the sea, and Jesus exercises sovereignty over the sea. And remember what I said, the sea was an image of primordial evil for the Israelites. So Jesus is extending the realm of his sovereignty from the natural to the supernatural. When the, when the swine herders see what has happened, of course, they're not happy because they are losing their economic uh, point of view and they don't have any insurance on this. And they bring back people from the city and from the country and they come back and they see this man sitting in his right mind at the feet of Jesus clothed. And after hearing how he's been freed, nobody celebrates the fact that this guy that they can't control has now been contained and in his right mind, and they ask Jesus to leave. The overwhelming fear holds captive to them. The, the verb here is sai echo, which in Luke 19 refers to armies, and in Luke 22 refers to the men guarding Jesus in the Passion narrative. Freedom is too dangerous. Freedom is too costly. Fear is too great. Though the legion has been expelled from the demoniac, the memory of the legion 
continues to plague the community, just as the memory of the Roman legion still reminds this community of their corporate tragedy. The Gerasenes begged Jesus to leave. So he goes away, as they asked, but not before he commands the man to return to his home, to his city, and explain what God has done for him to be a survivor, a witness to the God who has overcome fear with an overwhelming force. Thank you, Luke. The man obeys, sharing the mighty work that God is doing in Jesus. You know, from the moment that this guy shows up, the whole episode invites us to consider what Jesus has to do with the forces that occupy and control us. What forces occupy and control you? The story challenges us to think about Jesus' sovereignty over all of these powers, all these things that destroy human life, to stand watch on how people objectify creation, for example, or dehumanize one another, to be witnesses in such an environment. In the building of the beloved community, we are invited to be witnesses to God restoring power, to see the man even though we have to look through his trouble, to see him as a person for who he was created to be as God's child, created in the image of God. Underneath this marauding horde is a child of God, and Jesus never loses sight of him, and that's what's restored. And that's what creates a beloved community when we can look past all the categories and all the objectifications and all the dehumanizing that we do to each other by category and look closer to see the very heart of a person created good with inherent worth as a child of God. To look at a creation that has created tov, tov miod, the Hebrew for good, very good, and to see in its creation, in itself, not for its exploitation or what we can get out of it, but because it was created in inherent worth. A beloved community has to start when we see one another with inherent worth, the precious image of God stamped on each one of us. How many people in our world are haunted by traumatic past? tortured by memories that seem to have a greater way of identifying them than the love of God? How many live unsheltered and inadequately clothed like this man because of social and economic forces that they have no power over, no matter how hard they struggle? How many are imprisoned, regarded as barely human, excluded, cast out? How many are enslaved by addiction, so much so that they no longer know where the addiction ends and they begin? Where did the governing authorities rob people of their dignity, categorizing, demonizing, dehumanizing? Where do occupying armies still brutalize entire communities and hold them captive to fear? Jesus comes to challenge and cast out every power that prevents us from living fully and freely as human beings created in God's image. Jesus claims sovereignty not just over our soul, but our whole lives in the here and in the now. Many of us resist this good news. Finding deliverance from legion, just too frightening, too demanding, too costly, too out of control. What if, we say, as fear steers the boat? But those whom Jesus has touched for those of us who've encountered him and have been healed and freed, know that his liberating love is indeed its good news. The gospel that he commands us to proclaim throughout cities and towns, still today, God is at work in Jesus, bringing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Still today, Jesus is sending you and I as witnesses, as souls, soul survivors, S-O-U-L, by the way, to the goodness, as witnesses to the goodness of God, and how we have, each one of us, each creature, inherent worth and dignity endowed upon us by our Creator, those famous words say. 
If we're going to build a beloved community, it begins by insisting on inherent dignity and worth. As Jesus overturns and restores the man with legion and sees him and sees you for who you are, a beloved child of God in the beloved community. May God give us strength to face all the legions of our lives and know that his sovereignty claims us from God's original intent to be his beloved child. Amen.